Good. And uh, today we're going to continue our series through the Gospel of Luke. As a church family, we've been going through this Gospel together. The title of this series is Good News for All. That's what the Bible is about, is good news for all people, no matter who we are and what we've done. And, and this book, this Gospel, it was written by this man named Luke. He was a doctor and he had a heart to, to help this young Christian, his name was Theophilus, to help him understand about Jesus and tell about Jesus to this, this young Christian and so that he would grow in his faith. And we've seen so far, so as we've gone throughout the Gospel of Luke, the early years of Jesus' life, his birth, his miraculous birth. We've seen uh, his early years, his teenage years. And last time we looked at Jesus' baptism, we've seen John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had prepared the way for Jesus. He was telling the world that the Messiah, the Savior, the God was coming. And then we've seen uh, Jesus' baptism, which was incredible. And you know what I love about Jesus' baptism is we see, it's one of the few pictures in the Bible where we see the Trinity. Our God is one God, but He's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've seen that picture even in the baptism of Jesus. But now we, we're going to come on to Luke chapter 4 this morning. We're going to move on to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to see just before Jesus steps into ministry. I love reading about Jesus' miracles. I love reading about his teachings, but this is just before that happens. And something interesting happens just after Jesus was baptized. Now, the title of this message today is The Day That Jesus Used His Sword. The Day Jesus Used His Sword. And we'll be reading from Luke chapter 4. And we'll just read verse 1 to 2 together to start with. And the verses will be on the screen behind me also. And it says this, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. You know, over the last few weeks, uh, Georgina and I and my family, we've been talking about holidays I don't know if you have with your families as well. It's coming into that time of year, isn't it? Where we start thinking about planning holidays, talking about holidays, getting excited as the weather hopefully starts changing. I don't want any more snow, but hopefully it'll start changing. And as we've been talking about holidays together, I've been thinking about my first holiday or at least the first holiday that I can remember. That first holiday that I remember, I was three years old, so I've got a pretty good memory. Still, still all right at this moment in time. I haven't, I'm not 30 yet, so I still remember it uh, vaguely, but I was three years old, and uh, I remember my parents uh, took me with my grandparents and my uncle to Disneyland Paris. That's my first memory and uh, first holiday memory, and I remember just snippets of that holiday. We stayed in this hotel called the Newport Beach Club. Um, it was like a, a sea uh, marine sort of hotel. I remember my parents buying me this Donald Duck hat. Uh, I, don't, I haven't got it, unfortunately. I know you'd love to see me in that, but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, they bought me this Donald Duck hat. I remember them buying me this Mickey Mouse balloon as well. Oh, it might have been Minnie Mouse. I, don't, I can't remember which one. But I know we had this balloon as we went around the park. I remember uh, seeing some of the parades. I remember my grandfather and uncle teasing me, throwing me into, pretending to throw me into the river. I don't know if you remember that. My, my uncle's a bit of a boot. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I remember vaguely that. And I also remember my dad taking me to this castle. As you can see in Disneyland Paris, it's the Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty Castle, I believe it is. And uh, this was one memory that stood out to me because I was horrified. I don't know if you've ever been to Disneyland Paris, but right underneath this castle, right there, I don't know if you can see, there's a cave. And uh, I remember my dad taking me into this cave as a three-year-old boy, and all I could hear was these scary noises underneath. I thought, oh goodness, I don't really fancy going in here. And as we went underneath into this cave, underneath the castle, we found this creature. I think I got a photo of it, Dave. There it is. There was this giant animatronic dragon. And I remember being terrified. I remember being absolutely petrified at seeing this dragon. I wanted my dad to take me out today. I think my mother was with me as well. I wanted to get out today as soon as I could. I was petrified as a little boy. And I remember as we came out today, I remember my parents buying me something in Disney. They're always buying me. Fair play. I was spoiled as a kid. Fair play. But they bought me because I was scared. I remember them by me, I don't know if you remember this, a blue sword. It had a golden handle on it, and it was this sword so that I wouldn't be scared, so that I wouldn't be afraid of this dragon or anything like that. And uh, this sword was there to help me and, you know, to calm my fears, obviously. I remember using that sword as I grew up as well. 
My dad has still got the scars on his body as I used to whip him and hit him with that sword and stab him with that sword. We used to fight with that sword as as well as the boys. We used to have swords as well growing. Uh, But we use this weapon, this sword, to defeat defeat this enemy, obviously. That's what this, this sword was bought for. But did you know this morning that Jesus has a sword as well? Did you know Jesus had a sword and he used the sword because Jesus had an enemy just like I had, just like you have. Jesus had, an en- uh, had a sword and we read about the day that Jesus used his sword in Luke chapter 4. As I said, Jesus was led after his baptism into the wilderness. The Bible said he was led by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the filling of the Holy Spirit. And, and God, uh, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And, and the Bible says inter- something interesting there. After this amazing moment where Jesus was baptized, and we see that the Father says, this is my Son with whom I'm pleased. Jesus led, is led into the desert. And the Bible says there that he is tempted by the devil. Tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus, uh, Jesus is tempted by Satan. We believe that God is real in this place, but we also believe in a spiritual enemy, which is Satan, the devil. We believe that he exists as well, but I'm so glad that he is not equal with our God, that the enemy is a created being, and he has been defeated through what Jesus has done on the cross. I'm so grateful for that this morning. But we see here that Satan comes along to tempt Jesus, after this incredible moment here, Satan comes along and it's with this weapon of temptation. You know, temptation is that desire to do something that we know God doesn't like or agree with. Temptation tries to lead us away from God. That's why Satan uses it. This is one of his main weapons to destroy us, to lead us away from the Lord. That's what the enemy uses. And we see that Satan here, after this great blessing, comes with temptation. But did you know that Satan doesn't just use temptation after moments where we encounter God or great spiritual moments? But Satan comes at different points in our lives to tempt us. We're all tempted. Can you agree with that this morning? I'm tempted. We're all tempted in our lives. And there's this acronym that I once heard that can help us know when when we're susceptible to temptation because we're all susceptible to it. It's called HALT. And these are moments when we are susceptible. Well, I I know I'm susceptible to temptation in my life. When I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, and when I'm tired. These are moments where often the enemy comes easiest. When we're weak, when we're vulnerable, he comes when we're on our own to lead us away from God, to pull us away from God, to do things that God doesn't agree with. These are the times Satan comes. And we see that's when he attacks Jesus, when Jesus is isolated in the wilderness, when he's weak, when he's fasting and praying, but when he's hungry, when he's tired, when he's isolated, that's when the enemy comes to Jesus. And the enemy tempts Jesus in a few different ways. There's there's a few different temptations that Satan comes with to Jesus. And we need to realize this because he'll come with us. He'll tempt us in these areas as well. The first area that Jesus was tempted in was the temptation of comfort. It says this in Luke chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. It says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. You know, this is the the driver for all other temptations. Is Jesus was just about to start his ministry. Jesus was just commissioned by his father to begin preaching the good news and telling people about himself. He was about to begin his ministry. But we see here Satan tries to come with him at comfort. Jesus was about to fast and pray and get ready. So he's spiritually in tune, ready for his mission. Satan comes to try and tempt Jesus not to go and do God's will. And he'll do that for you and me. You know, as I've said before, God has a plan and a purpose for every person in this room. God has a plan and purpose for every person on this planet. But you know, so easily we can miss out on God's plan and purpose for our lives. Why? Because we seek our own purpose instead of God's purpose. I've discovered in my life following God's ways and doing what God tells us to do isn't always easy. I like a comfortable life. I I like to be safe. I like to be secure. I like to do what I want to do. 
But you know, God's will isn't often like that. It can be difficult. It can be challenging. Sometimes God's call on our lives can mean that we have to give up things, sacrifice things, lay things down in order to obey God. And, and Satan will come because he knows that it's hard and he'll try and get us to lead us astray and live comfortable lives. But God doesn't want us living comfortable lives. God doesn't want us being comfortable. God wants us to step into all that he has for us. I don't want to live a safe and secure life, but I want to step into God's will for my life. I want to make an impact on this world. I don't know if you do, but I do. But I believe that God wants us to as well. And the enemy will come and try and lead us not to step into God's will for our lives, to put our agenda, number one, instead of God's agenda. Satan tries to come with comfort for Jesus in this moment. The second temptation is the temptation of appetite. We see that Jesus was in that wilderness and he was fasting. In other words, Jesus had stopped eating. He had given up food. And the reason he had given up food wasn't because he was trying to lose weight. He wasn't trying to detox or cleanse or, or go on this health kick. It wasn't anything to do with that. The G reason why Jesus was fasting was so that he could be in tune with his heavenly father. So he could hear the voice of God in his life above every other voice. That's what fasting does. It helps us get rid of the things of this world from our lives so that God's voice is number one in our lives. And the enemy knew this, that Jesus was doing this, that Jesus would have been physically hungry because Jesus is fully man, but he's also fully God as well. And G the enemy would have known that Jesus was hungry. And so Satan comes along with his temptation of appetite. And it says there that in verse two to verse four, it says where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, Jesus ate nothing all that time, and he became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Physically speaking, Jesus was at breaking point here. You know, it's been said that humanity, we can't survive without food for longer than 40 days. Jesus was physically at breaking point here. And it's in this moment of weakness physically that Satan comes to try and tempt Jesus to, to just give him. Go on, have a, turn this into bread. Jesus, you are God. You can turn this in, this stone into bread. Why not? Go for it. Fill that hunger. Satisfy that hunger. Jesus was able to do that. He could have done that in a moment. He could, could have turned that rock into a bread instantly. But he knew that wasn't God's will. And so he doesn't give in there. But you know, Satan will come to us. Satan knows our hungers. Satan knows our desires. He knows our appetites. He knows those things that, that we long for in our lives. And he'll tempt us in many of those areas. You might say in what ways, what areas? He'll tempt us with food. He'll tempt us with sex. He'll tempt us with money. He'll tempt us with drugs, with alcohol, with abuse, with all these things. Satan comes and tells us, go on, just a little bit. Do it, go on. It won't harm, it won't hurt, but it'll lead us away from God. And these are the areas, this area was Jesus, Jesus was tempted in. But you know, I have good news for you this morning. We don't have to give in to those impulses or desires. We can live in God's will. We don't have to cave in those areas. Number three, the temptation that Jesus was tempted by was the temptation of pride. This is another area that Satan will come to. It says in verse five to eight, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it to all to you if you will just worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You know, pride is the root of all sin. Pride comes from Satan. Pride is saying, look at me, look how great I am. I'm better than God. I'm better than anybody else. That's what pride is. And that's what Satan's problem was. That's why Satan was kicked out of heaven. Satan was the lead worshiper in heaven, the Bible tells us. He led worship. He was an angel called Lucifer. But one day he, he got a glimpse of himself and he thought, look how amazing I am, that I'm better than God. And so he tried to, to try to get rid of God, but God cast him out. And you know, it's that, that sin of pride. And that is the root of sin is pride. It's about me. It's about selfishness. And pride can be the killer of us all. And we'll all be tempted in that area about us, selfish. Number one, put ourselves number one. Satan comes to us and tests us in that area. And finally, the fourth area of temptation that Jesus was tested in was the temptation of identity. It says this in verse 9 to 12, then the devil took him 
to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. This temptation of identity, if you are the son of God. Just a few moments before we see Jesus is baptized and his heavenly father says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But straight away after, Satan comes and says, if you are the son of God. That doubt, that temptation of identity. And you know, our world is struggling with that right now. The enemy's coming to our world right now with, there's an identity crisis. People don't know who they are, what gender they are. And that is a lie of the enemy. The enemy wants to distort the truth of God's word of who we are. As I've said before, God only created two genders, male and female. We are made in the image of our God. And we need to tell people who they are in God's eyes, that they're loved by God, created by God, chosen by God, that we are made in the image of God. And the enemy will poke at our identity all the time. The younger generation through social media, constantly bombarded with identity problems, identity issues. They want to look the best. They want to feel the best. They want to feel loved and appreciated all the time. But I'm so glad that our God says that we are loved by our God. That we don't need to seek approval of others, but we are loved by our God. That we don't have to try and change who we are or what we look like to appease people, but we are made in the image of God. You're beautiful. You were made in the image of God. You are His handiwork. You were formed by God and God loves you and He'll never forsake you. I want to encourage you this morning. If you were struggling in this area of identity, of who you are, because we all struggle in that from time to time, the enemy will come to us with that from time to time. I want to encourage you, get into this. See who God says you are. See how loved you are by our God. So Satan comes to Jesus and he tempts him in these areas. You know, Satan will come to us and he'll tempt us as well. But we need to realize one thing this morning as we come towards the end. And that is, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted because Jesus was tempted. And if Jesus was tempted, then you and I can be sure that we'll be tempted as well. But Jesus never gave in to that temptation. Temptation is not a sin. As it's been said before, it's not about the bait. It's about the bite. It's about giving in to temptation. That's what sin is. Sin isn't being tempted. It's giving in to that temptation. And we see that in the Bible that many people give in to temptation. You and I will give in to temptation. But our God never gives in to temptation. He never gave in. Jesus never came, gave in to temptation. Jesus was able to overcome this attack from the enemy. Satan used this weapon, but Jesus overcame. Jesus won the victory over the enemy. And you might say this morning, how can we get victory over it? Yeah, it was easy for Jesus. He's God. Of course, he was going to overcome temptation. Of course, he wasn't going to sin. It's easy for Jesus, but... But you don't know how hard it is for me. You don't know how difficult it is. You don't know how strong that temptation is. You don't know how hard it is for you and me. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus not only tells us how to do it, he shows us how to do it. He shows us, he's our model, he's our example, and he shows us how we can defeat temptation when the enemy comes to us. And you might say, how can we do that? How did Jesus do it? He did it with his sword. Now you might say this morning, Luke, have you gone crazy? There's no mention of Jesus swinging a sword here in Luke chapter 4. There's no mention of a sword at all. What do you mean Jesus used his sword to fight off temptation? Well, we see here that it says in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, it says, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In other words, the Bible is the sword of of the Spirit. This is our weapon to fight off the enemy. You know, the Apostle Paul there, he was talking about the armor of God, and he said we need to protect ourselves from the enemy who will come against us. He talks about the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. He talks about all these weapons, about all this armor, but he also talks about this weapon where we can go on the offensive as well, where it's not only being protected, but we can go on the offensive. And we see here that Jesus, on this day, he used his sword. And you and I have got this sword as well to fight off temptation. God has given us this sword 
to fight off the enemy, to see victory in our lives. Every time Satan came against Jesus with temptations in all these different areas, Jesus would fight back against the enemy every time. Satan, it is written. The scriptures say, he said, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He says, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. How do we overcome temptation and the attacks of the enemy in our lives? It's with the word of God. This is what we use. This is our strength. And you know, the enemy will do anything he can to stop us from reading this, taking hold of this, studying this. He'll want you to keep this on your bookshelf. He'll want you to have that app on your phone, but never, ever open it. That's what the enemy wants us to do because he knows the power of this weapon. But you know, this is our weapon to fight off the enemy. We need to be a people of the word, a people who read the word, who hide God's word in our heart, who understand God's word, who memorize God's word. It says in Psalm 119 verse 11, the psalmist said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It says in Psalm 37 verse 31, they have made God's law their own, so they will never slip from his path. Do you always want to follow God? Do you always want to be able to overcome the enemy? You need to read this. You need to get this into your heart and into your life. You know, a successful, a pastor once said, a successful, victorious Christian will be a Bible studying, a Bible reading, a Bible believing, a Bible speaking Christian. And that's the same for you and me. If you want to be an overcomer, if you want to see victory in your life over the enemy, then you need to read, study, pray over, believe, hold on to God's word. We need God's word. And you know, I'm so glad this morning that if you are being tempted today, that God will not let us be overcome by temptation. But as it says in Corinthians, he'll always provide a way of escape. We don't have to give in. We don't have to surrender. That there's no temptation that is too strong for us. But if we've got our God on our side and we hold on to him and his word, we can become victorious. It says in James 4 verse 7, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want to encourage you. Fill your mind with God's word. This was a game changer in my life. It can be a game changer in your life as well. It's not always easy. It's not always difficult. But I believe the word of the Lord to us this morning. It's time to use our swords. It's time to be a people who use our swords just like Jesus did. To be a people who know the word of God and read the word of God, study the word of God. And maybe you've come here today. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you don't know anything about the Bible. Then we as a church, we want to equip you. We want to help you. We want to teach you. We want to guide you in every way we can to read this, to study this. Even if you're a follower, been a follower of Jesus for many, many years and you're struggling in reading the Bible, we want to make this as simple as we possibly can. We want to help you as a church read and study God's word. And here's a little plug for you tonight. Tonight at five o'clock, we've got a fellowship at five service where we'll come together for fellowship, but we'll also be doing the Bible course. And this helps us to understand the Bible, read the Bible. So come along to that tonight. We've also got resources on our website and you can come and see myself and Paul and we'll help you and point you in the right direction so that you can get into God's word. Read God's word. It's the most important thing you do. Pick it up every day. Even if it's just for a moment, begin to read God's word. Get it into your heart and your life and then you'll be able to overcome the enemy. You'll be able to live in victory. So I believe God wants to encourage us this morning. It's time to use our swords. It's time to pull them out of our sheaths, pull and start fighting back against the enemy. And I believe when we do, we'll see God's victory in and through our lives.